Well, we have a special opportunity tonight, uh, brothers and sisters and young people, so we want to uh, be attentive to this, uh, this class. You can't have everybody get up and address this type of subject in this, in this way and from this perspective. So it's a special opportunity to listen to these things, and we look forward to our address from our brother Lane uh, tonight on this subject, Discovery of a Lost City, Sodom. Brother Lane. Uh, good evening, brethren and sisters and young people. Sodom is a bit of a funny place, isn't it? We ask people, what do you know about Sodom? Well, they say, I don't know. It's on, on the bottom of the Dead Sea. And if you would have told me three years ago that I'll be working in an excavation with maybe Sodom, I said, well, you must be daft. That's quite impossible. And actually, the call came two years ago said, uh, would you come and help us draw some architectural plans of the city Sodom? He said, well, don't you know that it says in the Epistle of Jude that it's set forth as an example of eternal fire, so it's gone. How can you expect to find it? And it says that in Genesis 19 that God overturned Sodom and Gomorrah. Well, the word overturn is like what you do with a cake. They'll turn it upside down and said, you can never find it. But I said, just give it a go. But what do you know about Sodom? If you go, for example, um, to the internet, you go to Yahoo Answer, it says, Sodom and Gomorrah were two separate cities that in present day lie under the Dead Sea in South Jordan. God brought fire, or brimstone, or sulfur out of heaven on those cities in judgment. The vast amounts of sulfur that exist in the Dead Sea are a direct result of this. Yahoo. Go to answers.com, say, Sodom and Gomorrah were cities in the Aegean Islands, and it's in Greece. What's the Christadelphian view? Can you open your hymn? Can you open your hymn book, please? At hymn 390. Hymn 390. And verse 2. Where it says, Who was saved from direst horror at that unexpected hour wherein Sodom and Gomorrah sank? overwhelmed to rise no more. Lot the faithful and his daughters were alone removed to Zohar. Where in the Bible does it say that Sodom sank in the Dead Sea? If you could show me one verse, I'd be very pleased. I'll believe you. You can't find it. It doesn't say that Sodom is in the Dead Sea. And the Dead Sea was not created when Sodom was destroyed. There are two distinct um, sites altogether. Anyway, let's go through the, the scripture. Some of you may know that I've been working on the illustrations of the ESV study Bible. And just a few months ago, they brought out the atlas. And they showed this picture, I didn't know about this, of, of the Dead Sea. And they see Sodom and Gomorrah and Zohar and Atma, Zebim, and all those smoky columns going up on the other side of the River Jordan. Well, where were those cities actually located? Well, two years ago, a good archaeologist friend of mine, Dr. Steve Collins, he's the dean of the University of Trinity Southwest in Albuquerque, and I'm, pro I'm professor there, I used to teach there quite a bit. Um, he rang me up and he said, well, why don't you come and, and have a look? So I did. And at the moment, they're working there on a site called Tel al Hamam. And I just got a, an email this morning from one of the team men, members to say, things in Jordan have been crazy. That's an email I got this morning in the archaeological field. Last week, a group of Russian archaeologists came and wanted to get a permit to, to put a submarine in the, in the Dead Sea to look for Sodom. <laughs> I don't know how deep a submarine can go because it doesn't sink. <laughs> Remember that the Dead Sea is now at its all-time lowest at minus 450 meters below sea level. Because the Dead Sea has been there for all time, there's nothing under it. At any rate, the Jordanian Department of Archaeology, that is to say, was called to meet them at the Dead Sea. When they arrived, it was a setup that the press waiting, and the Jordanians told them to get out of Jordan, and they could not proceed. But in turn, it precipitated the director of the Department of Antiquity in, of Jordan to send a news team to our site, Tel Al Hamam, and interview Dr. Collins and the Jordanian co-director. 
And then for the first time, they confirmed our site as the best Sodom fit. There's a gigantic turning point for our day. Can we were on the 6 and 8 p.m. national news? And God willing, in three weeks' time, I'll be joining our team. Well, here is Dr. Collins, Steve Collins. It's a good uh, colleague of mine. We've been working together for some 15 years. And he is pointing there on a map on Mount Nebo where he told me he believed that uh, Sodom was located. Well, we've been working together since 1995, and we both like challenges. We walked up, we climbed up the Roman ramp at Massad in 1995. That's after our first season of excavating AI. We've been working there for about seven years, so we got to know each other. He invited me to come to his university and lecture there. And every year we lead tours in Jordan and Israel. And the website is uh, BLE, that's Bible Lands Expedition Travel.com. Well, my challenge was the Temple Mount. I worked almost all my life trying to sort out all the problems of the Temple Mount. And Steve's uh, challenge was to find Sodom. So where did we go from here? Well, we went to the last year to the Department of Antiquities in, in Jordan in the Geographical Institute, and we're pouring over maps, trying to get some old area photographs to learn more about our site. But most importantly is where, according to the Bible, is Sodom. Actually, in the Bible, there are more indicators to where Sodom is located than where Jerusalem is located. We just don't read carefully enough. If archaeology has done one thing for me, is to read the Bible carefully, almost word for word, and you get your answers. The brother who taught me the truth a long time ago in Kibbutz Yad Mordechai in, in, in Israel, next to the Gaza Strip, he said, after every sentence, ask why, where, who, how. And if you do that, you get all sorts of answers which are quite unexpected. Now, the chapter we just read, Genesis 13, just open your Bibles again, have got so many indicators that is absolutely incredible. So let's, let's start and look at the critical points in those first 12 verses of Genesis chapter 13. And I've highlighted the indicators we need to know from scriptures in order to find Sodom. So Abraham went up from Egypt. He was in Egypt. He went to the Negev. When you see south in verse 1, that is usually the Negev, the southern part of Israel. So he came up from Egypt to the Sinai Desert through to the Negev. And he went up from place to place. He would have gone over Hebron and Bethlehem and Jerusalem. And they go further north, they come to Bethel. And he came to the place, as it says in verse 3, between Bethel and Ai. What happened there earlier? Abraham built an altar on the one hill in between Bethel and Ai. So he went back to the place where he had built an altar before. And then Lot looked up and he saw that the whole plain of the Jordan was well watered. It was like the garden of Yahweh. It was like the land of Egypt towards Zohar. Just remember these phrases, they're extremely important. And so Lot chose for himself the whole plain of the Jordan. And he set out toward the east. So in Bethel and Ea, and he went east. No point looking south. No, the Bible says he went east. And then Abram lived in the land of Canaan, while Lot dwelt among the cities of the plain, the plain of Jordan. That's where he went. He didn't go to the bottom of the Dead Sea to find and live in, 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 in Sodom. He went to the plain of Jordan. What does that mean? And he pitched his tent not toward, the Hebrew says, as far as Sodom, he went straight to Sodom. So here we can learn that it must be east of Bethel and Ai. It's in the plain of Jordan, which was well watered. It was like the garden of Yahweh. What's that? Like the land of Egypt. What is the parallel? And it's east of Bethel and Ai. 
Now, the word the plain of Jordan, the word plain is not, not a normal word for a plain. Plain is usually an emek or an arava in Hebrew. But a kikar, that's the word used in Genesis 13, yes, is usually translated as a talent or a loaf of bread. The idea is a kikar means a circle. You go to the old city in Jerusalem, you buy bread, and you get a pita, circular loaf of bread. When they exchanged silver or gold as a talent, there was a circular disc of gold or silver. In modern Hebrew, a kikar is a roundabout. Like in Tel Aviv, you've got kikar dizenkov, it's the roundabout of dizenkov. So it indicates a circle. It's the circle of the Jordan. That's how the plain of Jordan should be translated. It's not the plain of the Dead Sea. It's the plain of Jordan, says the Bible. There are 13 geographical uses of the word kikar. You only find in the Old Testament. It also refers to the disc-shaped southern Jordan Valley north of the Dead Sea. It looks like a circle. For those of you who look at atlases or have been in the land of Israel, you know you get the Sea of Galilee, and then the Jordan goes down through a valley, but it widens out where Jericho is, north of the Dead Sea. Have a look at these pictures. So this is a satellite photograph uh, of the Dead Sea area. So here you see the northern end of the Dead Sea. Here's the river Jordan going through a narrow valley and goes all the way down. But look at this area. It widens out into a circle. And it looks like a circular plain if you stand here above Jericho or here on Mount Nebo. If you look from a slightly different angle, we're now above Jerusalem more or less. Here's Jericho. Here's the River Jordan. Here it flows into the Dead Sea. And you can see there's a circular plain. That's the Hebrew word for plain. Kika means a circle, a disk. You can't get away from it. So, in this disk, in the plain of Jordan, the city of Sodom must be located according to the Bible. So the Kikar is also the Kikar of the Jordan, not the Kikar of the Dead Sea. The Jordan, Hayarden, refers only to the river Jordan proper. The Dead Sea is not the Jordan. The Jordan is not the Dead Sea. They're different systems. And Hayarden never includes any part of the, the Veil of Sidim. It ends, as the Bible says, I've put some references here if you want to write them down. It ends at the mouth of the Jordan below Pisgah. And Pisgah is Mount Nebo, just opposite Jericho. Just where the North Sea ends. You can look up. Let's, let's look up in Numbers 34. Comparing scripture with scripture is not only important for archaeology and geography, but for our spiritual life as well. So in Deuteronomy 34, Numbers 34, in verse 12, is talking here about the border of the land. So in verse 11, the coast shall go down from Shepham to Ripla, on the east side of Ain, the border shall descend, it shall reach unto the side of the Sea of Canaret, the Sea of Galilee, eastward. The border shall go down the Jordan, and the goings out of the Jordan shall be at the Sol Sea, the Dead Sea. This shall be your land. See, so the Jordan ends at the Dead Sea. And the, Jordan, the Dead Sea is not the River Jordan. Deuteronomy 3.17. You're talking about the land that was given on the other side, Jordan, in verse 16, to the Reubenites and the Gadites. It's all the land of Gilead, unto the river Arnon, half the valley, and the border even unto the river Yabok, which is the border of the children of Ammon. And it's wonderful. You can go to Jordan. You can stand there at the uh, Arnon Valley, very deep canyon in the south, and you can see there uh, the Yabok River as well. 
And then verse 17, it says, and the plain, the Kikar, the circular disc also, and Jordan, and the coast of, from Kinneret even, unto the Sea of the Plain, the Salt Sea, under Ashdod Pisgah eastward. So clearly indicates that the Jordan ends where it flows into the Dead Sea. Can you see that? Yes, so the, the Dead Sea is not part of the River Jordan at all. I could look more of them, but that would take a bit of time. But you can write down, if you want to check it up later on, uh, Deuteronomy 3:17 and 27, 4, verse 47 to 49, in Joshua 15, verse 5, and 18, verse 19. It always indicates that the Jordan ends where it flows into the Dead Sea. So look then at this, this uh, topographical map of the land of Israel. Think of that water system that goes right through the middle of the land, the Great Rift Valley, the Jordan River Valley. That is the outline of it. Now it starts at the top where Mount Hermon is. Because the Mount Hermon is all covered with snow, the snow melts, the water penetrates in the mountain, goes down the mountainside, makes four different heads which form one river, the River Jordan. And the Jordan flows there into the Sea of Galilee. And from the Sea of Galilee, the river goes down, that is called the River Jordan proper, until you come to the Dead Sea, which is a different system, although it's all one water system, of course. Then we read in Genesis 13 that the Kikar was, in verse 10, if you go back to Genesis chapter 13 and verse 10, Lot lifted up his eyes and beheld all the plain of all the Kikai, the circular disk of the Jordan, that was well watered everywhere before Yahweh destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, even as the garden of Yahweh, like the land of Egypt, as thou comest unto Zohar. It was well watered. Well, when I was there last January, before the, the rains actually started, there was still water running through all the valleys there. Um, well watered, like the garden of Yahweh. I'll go to Genesis chapter 2. The Garden of Yahweh must be the Garden of, of Eden. What does it say there about that river? Genesis 2 and verse 10. It says, One river went out of Eden to water the garden. And after that it was parted. But it was one river going right through the middle of the garden. It is like... Egypt, there will be no Egypt, it was no Nile. The Nile is Egypt. There's one river going right through the middle of Egypt. It overflows its banks, just like the river Jordan does. So it's quite clear, if you go back to Genesis 13, it must be well watered, the plain, and one river going right through the middle of it, just like in the Garden of Eden and just like in Egypt. That's what the Bible tells us. Well, if you look at this picture, the, here's the Kikar, which ends at the Dead Sea. The, these riverbeds are flowing with water most of the year, all of them. Yes? And then there's where Jericho is, also in the Kikar of the Jordan. And the River Jordan goes right through the middle of it. Just like the river went through the middle of the Garden of Eden, as verse 10 tells us, and the Nile goes through the middle of the land of Egypt. And the Nile ends when it flows into the sea, into the Mediterranean. And there are all sorts of sites there, those red circles. Tel Hamam. that's a site we're excavating, the largest site in this area. A smaller one, Tel Kafrein, and you get Nimrin, Bleibel, and Musta. See, it's only the last few years that we could go into the area because it's always a military zone. You couldn't go and excavate there because you get your head shot off by the Israelis or by the, some Palestinians. And therefore it was a kind of a terra ignocita. You know, it's an area that is unknown, out of bounds, since the 1948 war. And only now is it possible to go there and excavate. Let's go back to Lot in verse 10. He lifted up his eyes and he viewed the entire Jordan disk from the east. Yes, he was in Bethel, 
and you looked east. So if you're in Bethel and you like look east, then you must see the whole Kikar of the Jordan. What do you see when you're in Bethel and you get your telephoto lens out? Well, first of all, here is on a satellite picture, the Dead Sea, Jerusalem. Here's Bethel and Ai. And here's the disk. So what are we being told? That he looked east. Actually, if you are in Bethel and Ai, you can barely see the Dead Sea. Only the northern bit of it, because the mountains are all in the way. So here's a photograph. Well, this is what you can see from Bethel and Ai. Here's a photograph taken from Bethel, and here you can see the circular disk of the Jordan. Jericho is just below the mountain here. And here is Mount Nebo. As I said, it was below Pisgah. Well, here is where the Jordan ends. The Jordan runs right here, and all the water coming down from the plateau, the Moabite plateau, makes this valley very, very fertile. This is what you see when you look east. That's what Lot did. If you look south, you can just see the northern tip of the Dead Sea. That's all you can see. So there's no point saying Sodom is in the south, southern end of the Dead Sea because you can't see it from Bethel. No point saying it is somewhere on this side but where Masada is, where you to show you Lot's wife, because you can't see it from Bethel. Lot could see Sodom from Bethel, quite clear from Genesis chapter 13. So he looked, he then traveled eastward from Bethel and Ai and he pitched his tent at Sodom. Well, back in Bethel Ai, here is east, so this is the direction he went to. It can only end up in the circle, the circular plateau of the river Jordan. So if you take only Genesis 13 in account, then here's the Dead Sea area. Don't be looking here for Sodom because you can't see it from Bethel and Ai. This is the only part where you can see the plain of the Jordan. And this circular area is called the Kikar of the Jordan, about 25 kilometers in diameter. Jericho is on the west side of the Kikar, and Sodom and Gomorrah must be on the east side. You can't see Jericho from Bethel and Ai because it's too deep down. You can only see on the other side, only this part of the Kikai, can you can see from Bethel because the mountains are in the way. And then uh, now Steve Collins went there with all this information. He said, I, for three weeks I'll be reading every day Genesis 13 and 14, a few times in a day, trying to understand what is the Bible telling me, where Sodom is. And then he had an opportunity to go to the site and all these sites belong to the Middle Bronze Age. So in archaeology, we, we don't talk about you know, 2000 BC or 3000 BC. We divide the chronological areas into uh, the Early Bronze Age and the Late Bronze Age, Iron Age, and, and, and so on. This particular city must belong to the Middle Bronze Age, according to archaeology. I'll explain that later on. And so he got an inkling that those cities must be there. And then he went to the site in the Kikar of the Jordan. And then he assumed that Sodom was the biggest city in the Eastern Jordan disk because it's always mentioned first. You see, often cities are called in pairs. Bethel and Ai. Bethel is always the largest and Ai is the smaller one. So Sodom and Gomorrah. Sodom must be the bigger one, and Gomorrah the smaller one. If you look at the list of the cities, they're often uh, counted from the south. Because the southern cities mentioned first, Sodom, a bit north is Gomorrah, and then Adma and Zebedee. That's the biblical way of making lists of city. So leave that for a time being. We also need to look at Genesis chapter 14. Now Genesis 14, if you open the Bible there, it says, It came to pass in the days of Amraphel, king of Shinar, Ariok, king of El-Assar, Kidaliomer, king of Elam, and Tidal, king of the nations. These made war with Bera, the king of Sodom. 
Dus Beersha, king of Gomorrah, Shinab, king of Atma, Shamiba, king of Zebuim, and the king of Bila, which is Zoar. And these were joined together in the Vale of Sidon, which is the Salt Sea. Twelve years they served Kidaliomer, and in the thirteenth year they rebelled. And in the fourteenth year came Kidaliomer and the kings that were with him and smote. Look, look on the map. He smote the Rephaim in Ashtaroth Karnaim, that's where it is. So they came from Mesopotamia, following the same route which Abraham took, coming over Damascus into the land, staying on the east side of the Jordan, smote the Rephaim here, and then the Zuzim, the next group of people, in Ham, and then the Imim in Shaveh Kiryatayim, that is here. They went down all the way to the Horite in Mount Seir, that is Edom, here is Mount Seir. Then they crossed over, went to Paran, you see, verse 6, to El Paran, which is by the wilderness. They returned, they came to Ein, Mis Ein Mishpat, which is Cades. Here it is, Cades Barnea, from where Joshua sent out the spies, Moses sent out the spies to spy out the land. And then they turned back, and they, it says, then they went to the country of the Amalekites, and also the Amorites that dwelt in Gatsitzon Tamar. Now, Gatsitzon Tamar, if you look at the, the, I've had a text here up. According to 2 Chronicles 20 and verse 2, Gatsitzon Tamar is En Gedi. So they came in a big sweep on the east side of the Jordan, all around the bottom of the Dead Sea, to the Negev, to Paran, to Kays, and now they were in En Gedi. So all the five, four kings were there. The kings of the north, they were now in En Gedi. And what happened next? Because, well, it comes here on the map, then went out, so while these guys were in En Gedi, then came the king of Sodom and the king of Gomorrah, the king of Atma, the king of Zebu, and the king of Bila, and they joined battle with them in the Vale of Sidim. So where's the Vale of Sidim? Well, if you are here in En Gedi, and Sodom and Gomorrah are here, then it must be somewhere in the middle. So, if you have a, a larger map, Amrafel, Ariok, and Kidoliome, they were here near Engedi. If the kings of Gomorrah and Sodom and all these guys here, they were here, they would have set out and meet here in the Vale of Sidim. It's the only place where it can be. Now, and then we read that they fell into slime pits. Well, since about two years ago, there are slime pits again. But the word slime pit, in verse 10 of chapter 14, look at it. In verse 10 of chapter 14 in Genesis, it says, The veil of Sidon was full of slime pits. Well, I don't know what slime is. It's very slimy. But it doesn't say so in the Hebrew at all. It isn't asphalt. It isn't slime. The Hebrew word chemar is clay. It's the word for clay. They were clay pits. They were there when the battle took place between the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah and the other guys. And when they were fleeing, they fell into slime pits. And nobody knew what they were. Up to about two years ago, when those slime pits, those clay pits, those sinkholes, that's our modern word, appeared again. How come they appear now and they didn't appear before? Because of the salt works by the Jordanians and the Israelis, they take out so much water out of the Dead Sea, and the River Jordan is tapped by the Israelis just when it comes out of the Sea of Galilee through the National Water Carry, water, waters almost the whole land of Israel, but nothing much goes down the River Jordan. So the Dead Sea goes down every year by one meter. If the water goes down, what happens to the water that is locked underneath the sides of the Dead Sea. The water gets withdrawn but because the water level goes down and therefore sinkholes appear. And it was the same in the time of Abraham and the battle of Genesis chapter 14. So while those kings of Sodom and Gomorrah were fleeing, they didn't look where they were going, they fell into the slime pits. And they said he almost lost his life there because it's like quicksand. Now it happens when the level of the Dead Sea goes down. 
geologists have worked for years uh, looking into all the sides of the mountains, well, here you look at Qumran, into caves, looking at deposits, water depo deposits, and salt deposits. And they've been able to uh, graphically portray how the level of the Dead Sea changed through time. Our next slide is an, an animated uh, an animation of the size of the Dead Sea. It's the main part of the picture. And on the side, there's a section through the Dead Sea. You can see how it goes up and down. There's a timeline underneath there. It gives you an idea what's happened to the level of the Dead Sea through the ages. So here is the Dead Sea. We are now in 3000 BC. That's the time of the flood. According to these geologists, it was very, very large. Then it goes down to the time of Abram, 2000. Then the sea was very, very small. This is the time of Abram, Melchizedek. In the time of the judges, in the time of the kings, the water went up again. It went down a little bit. It stays the same up to about the Hellenistic period. And then you come to the time of Christ, the water level goes up again, as you can see here, and then it went down very, very low in the Byzantine period. And then the water level climbed up again, all through the Middle Ages, with a bit of an up, and then it goes down. And at the moment, it is very, very small. The southern part of the Dead Sea is completely dry. You can walk across here from Masada to the other side. And that is when those sinkholes appear. So this graph shows exactly that we're actually lower now even than in the time of those kings of Sodom and Gomorrah who fell into the slime pits, which are here. That's the only place where you can see them today. So it is caused by the low level of the Dead Sea. Shows that the Dead Sea was there because Sodom and Gomorrah weren't destroyed yet. If there's no Dead Sea, you can't find any sinkholes. So it is quite illuminating that we are now at the same level as in the time of Abraham and Lot. And so, going to the site, Sodom must be the largest one. And here is the largest Middle Bronze Age site in well, practically the whole of the Middle East. It's bigger than Megiddo, it's bigger than Chatzor, it's bigger than uh, Lachish. It's a kilometer long. When I went the first time and I look at the fortifications, it took me three hours to walk around the site. Here's our bus standing and here's our little hut where we keep our tools. And from the air, this is the upper tail and this is the lower tail. It's an enormous site. A huge site, bigger than any in Israel. If you stand on the Mount, Mount Nebo and you look down, then you can see quite clearly where it is. Right there in the middle of this circle, here's the upper tail and it's the older lower tail. That is where Tel El Hamam is located, a thousand meters long and about 600 meters wide, an enormous site. As I said before, in archaeology we talk about Bronze Age and Iron Age and so on. According to the archaeological time frame, the story of Abram Lot belongs to the Middle Bronze Age. Now, the Middle Bronze Age goes from 2000 BC, time when Abram was born, up to about 1500 BC. That's what we call the Middle Bronze Age. Then you get the Late Bronze Age from 1500 to 1200, and then you have what we call the Iron Age, which is the time of the kings of Israel. So Abram and Lot must be in what we call the Middle Bronze Age and not later on in the Iron Age. So if you go to a site and say, well, that is Sodom, well, do you have Middle Bronze? If you don't have Middle Bronze, it can be Sodom. Let's go to Genesis chapter 10, where Sodom is mentioned for the first time before the flood. In Genesis chapter 10, we have the borders in verse 19, of the land of Canaan. See it? And the border of the Canaanites was from Sidon, as thou comest to Gerar, 
into Gaza as thou comest into Sodom and Gomorrah and Atma and Zebulun, even into Lasha. So the borders of Canaan start at Sidon, here in modern day Lebanon, goes all along the coast of the Mediterranean up to Gaza, where the Gaza Strip is, goes across towards the Dead Sea, where Sodom and Gomorrah, Atma and Zebulun are located. In the table of nations of Genesis chapter 10, before the, the flood, or just after the flood, but before the time of Abraham. So, and then the border goes up to Lasha, that is Laish or Dan, and then goes across to Zidon. In Genesis 10, we've got Sodom and Gomorrah, and we call that the early Bronze Age. That is much earlier because it goes back to 3000 BC. So there was already a site of Sodom before Abram got there, before Lot got there. So Abram and Lot are here in the Middle Bronze Age, but that lower tell belongs to the Early Bronze Age. It's much older. Here we find in this period of time, between 3000 and 2000 BC, the cities of the Kikar in Genesis chapter 10. So Sodom and the other cities of the Jordan disc would have occupations dating from the early Bronze Age, but also the Middle Bronze Age. And then you go to a site, before you excavate, we usually walk around the site and pick up the pot shirts, which never get destroyed, and you can understand from the pot shirts what kind of time periods are represented on the site. So then, having our archaeological time frame from 3000 to 2000 up to 1000 BC, then it's quite clear that this must be the time frame of Sodom and the cities of Jordan Disc. That's what you expect to find before you actually start excavating, if you take the Bible uh, carefully. So, and then you go to the site. It's a Bronze Age city, exactly the time frame of Abram and, and Lot. The lowest city, which you can see in brown here, is the oldest part of Sodom. That is Genesis chapter 10. But this city, the Middle Bronze City, is the time of Abraham and Lot. And there's even an, a later occupation in the time of the kings of Israel. And so here we're excavating. The stones which you see here belong to the time of the kings of Israel. But down below, a meter thick layer, that layer of occupation belongs to the time of Abraham and Lot. And excavating there, you can see the walls of the houses, I don't want to say this house of Lot, but he lived in Sodom somewhere. This house belonged to people that lived in Sodom during the time of Lot. And you find a pot shirt, a very typical little jugglet, so it fits exactly the picture of the time frame of the Bible. In Genesis 19, We read that two angels came to Sodom at even, and Lot sat in the gate of Sodom. What's the importance of that information? Well, there's no point having a city with houses, and on one side build a gate. Please go through the gate, so no, I'd rather go around it. It doesn't work like that. If you've got a gate, you've got a city wall, because the gate is the only opening through the city wall. So it means if there's a gate, there must be a city wall. And so looking at the site, schematically, here's the lower tell, here's the upper tell. Here you expect to find in the middle Bronze Age, in the upper tell, in the lower tell you find already a city wall and towers have been excavated already. There must have been a city there which was destroyed, but it's not the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah, but the upper tell had a city wall as well. This is a city of Lot. There must be a gate which we haven't found yet. There was a city and that was destroyed by fire. See, when you read first Sodom was destroyed by fire, I think the whole city is gone. But in archaeology, all those ancient sites like Megiddo and Chatzor and Bet Shan, they all built layer upon layer upon layer upon layer. So when Sodom was destroyed, it actually means the upper layer of Sodom, where the people lived at that time, was destroyed. So you know, the whole tell must disappear, don't say so. Now, and then we found actually the fortifications of that city. Here, 
all built over the ruins. So excavating on the top there, we found a rampart, a typical Middle Bronze Age rampart of the city of Lot. And the city, the buildings must be inside. Now here is the mud brick wall starting to be excavated, going down, sloping on the side. You're standing at the bottom. This was the fortification of the city of Sodom in the time of Lot. And somewhere through this uh, ramp made of mud brick, of you know, little stones or bricks made of mud brick, calculating them, they must have made 44 million mud bricks to build a fortification around this city. It was an enormous kind of work. And so archaeologically and geographically, the biggest fortified Bronze Age city on the eastern Jordan uh, disc is the most likely candidate for Sodom, called today Tel El Hamam. It spreads over one kilometer square. <laughs> he called it the queen of the southern Jordan Valley. Yes, it's bigger than any other Bronze Age site in the whole Middle East in this particular area. So this is the Middle Bronze Age uh, rampart then. There was a little um, a space of time when the site was unoccupied. And look at the destruction. Digging in this square, below where you can see the stones, this particular level was full of ash and destruction. You see a picture here of a mud brick, which has been fired so hard you couldn't break it. Usually if you must be very careful when you dig a wall that was made of mud brick, which is a little mud that break in your hand. This was as hard as a stone, been exposed to an enormously high temperature. And parts of the roof, they were infused with sulfur and hard as stone. Normally it's brittle like anything. You only get it if something is burnt at a very, very high temperature. Here I'm standing here in the burnt palace of Bera, king of Sodom. You can see that the bricks here are still red because it changes color from brown to red if you burn mud brick. And think about it, king. Now his palace must have been here right on the top, and the view from his palace was the whole of the Kikar of Jordan. Here's the Dead Sea, here's Jericho, here's Gomorrah, uh, right in view, a satellite city of Sodom. And so it all seems to fit very, very well indeed. And then in one place, they found a, a few potsherds which had melted. They're green. And you need a temperature of over 6,000 degrees centigrade to melt a potsherd. Uh, my colleague Steve lives in um, Albuquerque, New Mexico, where in 1945 they had those nuclear tests. And the result after those tests, they looked at the whole environment, they saw that the, gla that the sand was turned into green glass. Most things turn into green glass. And when he took this sample to the laboratory, they said, oh, there's trinitite. So trinitite, also known as atomite or alamorgal glass, is the name given to the glassy residue left on the desert floor after the plutonium-based trinity nuclear bomb test. So when he saw the, the pot he said, that's trinitite, without any doubt. He turned it over. What? He says, it's a pot shirt. Where did he get that from? They cut right through the middle with a very fine sole, and they saw that below the green glaze, there were actually bubbles inside the potsherd from the heat this potsherd was exposed to. Go to Genesis 19 and verse 28. There's more information which is extremely important. In verse 27, I mean, that is after verse 28, 24, Yahweh rained upon Sodom and upon Gomorrah brimstone and fire from Yahweh out of heaven. He overthrew those cities and all the plain and all the inhabitants of the city, and that which grew upon the ground. His wife looked back from behind him as he became a pillar of salt. And Abraham got up early in the morning to the place where he stood before Yahweh. He was in Hebron, by the way. He looked towards Sodom and Gomorrah, and what did he see? Toward all the land of the plain, he beheld the smoke of the country went up as the smoke of a furnace. 
If you've got a big bonfire, the smoke goes all over the place. But a furnace, with a chimney, the smoke goes straight up. That's what Abram saw. Exactly a pillar like you have from a nuclear bomb. I don't say there was a nuclear bomb in, don't, don't mistake what I'm saying, but the fact that there was a pillar of smoke going up is the same as you see when you have an atomic bomb. How does that happen? Because the, when the bomb comes down, you get a horizontal impact, but the path through which it comes down is a vacuum. It sucks up sand and stones, which get superheated, and then they come raining down upon the site. It says God rained down a fire and brimstone. Now, the best lexicon I have at home is uh, written by John Parker. It was made in actually 1823. That's the um, lexicon which John Thomas always used. He's a very intelligent man, and he looked at that word uh, brimstone. Brimstone is an old English word for burning stone. That's all it is. So make a note in the Bible, brimstone is burning stone. He says brimstone or burning stone, gofrit in Hebrew, is always applied, written in 1823. Yes? Applied or alludes to that meteorous, inflammable matter which God rained upon Sodom and Gomorrah. That's what the Hebrew word indicates. And we believe that's how Sodom was destroyed. Words that are related to gofrit is gopher wood, of which the Ark of Noah was made. There's so much resin in that wood that it stays afloat. Yet the cypress is from the same kind of word, kuparisos, gofrit. So it isn't sulfur, it's very durable against rot and worms, used for shipbuilding and so on. So it is a resinous, inflammable juices which you find in that particular tree, and that is the word used. Now, my colleague thinks that Sodom and Gomorrah were destroyed by a meteorite. Now, that was his idea. It sounds plausible, but just think about it. If you get a huge meteor coming down from the sky, and it fragmentizes on impact, then it hits the ground at a terrific speed. But the path through which that meteor comes down creates a, a vacuum. First of all, you get an impact on the ground, it says that God overturned the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. But you can look at the walls in the section. They're just tumbled over. That's the horizontal impact when you get such an impact on the ground. But that path through which it comes down becomes a vacuum. It sucks up uh, soil and stones, goes up in that vacuum, gets superheated, and comes down as burning stones. It's exactly what the Bible says. So something, I had a meteorite, certainly not a nuclear bomb, something must have come down from heaven, it's sucked up, it's had a horizontal impact, sucked up the stones, superheated them, and then smashed them down again. And that is how Sodom and Gomorrah were destroyed. All those cities were destroyed, all those five of them, at the same time, in the same way. Now, that is very interesting. So we have here Tel el Hamam, the largest city, we believe Sodom, Talcafrain, maybe Gomorrah, Nimrim, they go together again. You see, Sodom and Gomorrah, Atma and Zebuim. Zebuim, I was teaching my students this morning, if you've got a word like Elohim, if it ends in im, it's plural. So, there were two sites there, one beside the other, a twin satellite cities of Atma and Zebuim. So, according to the direction we get in the Bible, and the way the, those cities were destroyed, it fits exactly the picture of Sodom and Gomorrah in the Kikar, as we've been seeing in the Bible. And in three weeks' time, covering, I'll be there again and see what I've been, been discovering so far. But what can we learn from the whole story of Sodom and Gomorrah? As Christadelphians, it's not just written here for, an, for archaeologists so we can find the site. Yes? Well, to us, reading the Bible, Genesis 13 and 14, and coming to a site which fits perfectly, shows that the biblical record is absolutely true. Taught me, I must read the Bible so carefully. If it says east, well, look east and don't look south because you won't find it. Yes? Don't believe fables, 
including hymn 390. I'm so pleased that the hymn book is not part of the BASF because <laughs> I'll be disfellowshipped at the end of this lecture. <laughs> Don't bring your family to Sodom. It says, Lot, he vexed his righteous soul. Oh, he had hoped perhaps to convert Sodom. What happened, his wife was converted to the ways of Sodom and his two daughters as well. He lost his family. By choosing to live in the wrong place. Oh, very fertile, well watered, the river Jordan there, plenty of food, better than on top of the mountains where Abraham stayed, but at the cost of his family. And don't live a Sodom lifestyle. But what is a Sodom lifestyle? You see, usually when we think about Sodom, we think about the immorality, sexual immorality. But that's not the only thing. Go to Ezekiel chapter 16, please. And then we come a lot closer home. In Ezekiel chapter 16, we read there in verse... It talks about Samaria and Jerusalem, but they make a comparison with Sodom and her daughters. It says there in verse 48, As I live, says the Lord Yahweh, Sodom thy sister has not done she nor her daughters as thou hast done, thou and thy daughters. Because behold, this was the iniquity of thy sister Sodom. This is why God destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah and the other cities. Number one is pride. Number two is fullness of bread. Three is abundance of idleness was in her and in her daughters. Neither did she strengthen the hand of the poor and the needy. They were haughty. They committed abomination before me, and therefore I took them away as I saw good. I don't use the NIV very much, but in this time I like it to look at it. They say... They're arrogant, overfed, and unconcerned. And that's exactly the world in which we live, isn't it? So we need to learn from Sodom and Gomorrah and the fierce destruction which we're excavating at the moment that we mustn't be proud. We are overfed. We've got too much to eat and we've got too much free time. What do we do with it? Do we use it to study the word of God, to sit with our family around, go to Bible schools, go to Bible class, go to Sunday school? Or do we just sit on the couch and watch TV and let the world come into our home? What do we do with all the free time we have? We only work four and a half days a week nowadays instead of six. What do we do with it? And do we strengthen the hand of the poor and the needy? That's what God pointed out, are the sins of Sodom and Gomorrah. Compare Abram and Lot. Abram's his faith was counted as righteousness. But Lot vexed his righteous soul. He was righteous in the eyes of God. But to live in a way that you're vexed all your life is not very productive. Abram lived on the mountains, away from the cities. Remember the four geographical uh, areas in Israel? You get the coastal strip where the Philistines lived. All the holy places were on top of the mountains. That's where Abram wanted to be. He wanted to be where Hebron was, where Bethlehem is, where Jerusalem is, Shiloh and Shechem. But Lot went into the valley of death. It's, he lived in a wealthy and a liberated city, just like we live in a liberated society. Anything goes. Abram had 318 young men, educated, it says instructed, it's the same word for education, yet educated 300 young men in his own home not only in the scriptures but with sword and spear as well and those 318 young men could defeat the army of four kings of mesopotamia but lot's wife and daughters became morally corrupt the why the heart of lot's wife was in sodom and look what those daughters did afterwards those are the ways of sodom abraham received a son of promise Lot's wife and son-in-law died. Remember what Jesus says. Remember Lot's wife. Uh, 
I hope you agree with me that Sodom is not on the bottom of the Dead Sea. Jesus says in Matthew 10, verse 15, Verily I say unto you, it shall be more tolerable for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah in the days of judgment than for that city. So Sodom will be remembered at the day of judgment. You're still in Ezekiel chapter 16. Look what it says in verse 55. This is in the kingdom when everything will be restored again. It says, when thy sister Sodom and her cities, sisters, her daughters, shall return to their former estate. And Samaria and her daughters shall return to their former estate. Then thou, Jerusalem, and thy daughters shall return to your former estate. Jerusalem is going to be restored as the capital of the land of Israel. Samaria, the northern part of Israel, is going to be restored as part of the inheritance of the saints. And Sodom will also be restored. It will be a city of Sodom in the kingdom. It's on the bottom of the Dead Sea. Very difficult to build a city there. So this, then, brothers and sisters, is what we've learned from Genesis 13 and 14, reading accurately and following the scriptures and finding most likely what is Sodom. The future, well, here's Jerusalem on the top of the mountains. This is the area where Abram preferred to be. In Ezekiel 47, verse 8, we read about a new river coming out of the temple. The waters that issue out toward the east country go down into the desert, go into the sea, which being brought forth into the sea, the water shall be healed. That fresh water, abundant water coming out of Jerusalem will take away the salinity of the Dead Sea, but the Dead Sea will stay where it is, because fishermen will still stand in En Gedi. If you now go to En Gedi and got a fishing rod in your hand, and you could you float in the water, people think you're soft in the head. <laughs> yes? But in the kingdom, it will be able to, to fish there because fishes will live again in the Dead Sea. Zechariah says, it shall be in that day that living water shall go from Jerusalem, half of them to the former sea, and half to the hinder or the western sea, which is the Mediterranean. In summer and winter shall it be. We love the land of Israel, but what is really missing is a good river, isn't it? And it's going to be a river in Jerusalem, in the land of Israel, healing the waters of the Dead Sea, as you shall see tomorrow or the day after, is a type of death itself. And then will all the earth be filled with the knowledge of the glory of Yahweh as the waters cover the sea. Thank you.